Okay, so we were discussing the properties of closed sets in the last class. Let us just recall a few properties which uh, we discussed. Let us say that X D is a metric space. Then the first thing that we saw was that uh, empty set and full space X are closed sets. Okay. And then another thing was that if we take any arbitrary family of closed sets, then its intersection is also closed. Okay. So if uh, f alpha, say alpha in some indexing set lambda, is a family of closed sets. then intersection f alpha alpha in lambda is closed okay and lastly if uh, i mean this is not true of unions in case of unions you have to take only a finite family okay so if uh, if f1 f2 fn are closed sets then union f j j going from 1 to n is closed okay and we have seen that as far as uh, proofs of these are concerned i mean one can proceed in several ways but one way will be that uh, use the fact that any set a is closed if and only if its complement is open okay and well using that we can say that since each f alpha is closed complement of f alpha is open that is x minus f alpha is open okay and we have seen that in case of uh, in case of open sets union of any arbitrary family of open sets is open so union of this over alpha in lambda this will be open okay and this union is nothing but uh, x minus intersection f alpha right okay and this must be open and this is open means this must be closed okay similarly you can prove about the intersections also but of course that is not the only way you can prove this directly also for example how does one prove that any set is closed you just take any point in the closure and show that that point is uh, in the in the set so for example suppose you want to do it that way take a point in the closure of this x is a closure of intersection of what does it mean that if you take any open ball with let us say x is such a point if you take any open ball with center at x then it must intersect this set which is intersection okay. but if it something intersects intersection then it must intersect each of the set okay which is same as saying that if, if it is the closure of f alpha for each f alpha but f alpha is closed so x belongs to f alpha okay. and now if it happens for each alpha it belongs to the intersection okay so whichever way either you use the complements or prove directly the proofs are fairly straightforward okay all right then next thing that we will also see is that see for example in the discrete metric space we have seen that every subset is open okay it also means that every subset is closed right because uh, you complement will be open so okay now in case of the real line we have seen that every uh, open set every non empty open set is a union of a countable family of disjoint open intervals okay now does it say that how to get closed sets in the real line it does because all that you do is that you take any countable family of open intervals and drop that family so whatever remains must be a closed set okay so that gives again several examples of closed sets we have also seen that closed ball is a closed set okay uh, let me just say a couple of uh, things about this is it clear that in any metric space singleton x is always a closed set okay suppose you take a singleton set x okay is it clear that it must be closed okay is it obvious that its complement must be an open set right because if you take the complement x minus singleton x okay can you easily find a ball containing it which is disjoint from this set singleton x right okay so complement is open 
So, this must be closed. Okay. It again it means it will if you combine this with this last observation here, it will mean that every finite set is closed, okay. because every finite set is a finite union of singleton sets. So, it is closed. Okay. Of course, again as we have said, seen in the case of open sets, we cannot replace this by an arbitrary family. Okay. You cannot say that arbitrary family of close uh, that union over the arbitrary family of closed sets is closed, because well what we can do is that you can take any arbitrary set then that will be a union of singleton sets. Okay. So, if that were true it will mean that every set is closed so which is not the case. So, this last uh, and uh, even otherwise also you can easily find counter examples to show that you cannot replace the finiteness you cannot dis dispense with the assumption of finiteness here. Okay. All right. But this whole process of uh, removing a countable family of open intervals from real line can lead to fairly complicated sets. Okay. We shall see one example shortly, but before that let me also uh, make one more comment. So, suppose A is a subset of a real line, okay. suppose A is a subset of real line and suppose A is non empty and bounded above. Okay. Let us say suppose, uh, suppose uh, A is non empty and bounded above. Then we know that by LUB axiom, if a subset is non empty and non -empty, it must have a least upper bound. Okay. So, let us say alpha, uh, let us say alpha is LUB of A. Okay. Okay. Then what I want to say that alpha must be in the closure of A. Okay. Suppose alpha is uh, supremum of A, then alpha must be okay, in the closure of A, then alpha belongs to A closure. How does this follow? Suppose you take any open ball with center at alpha. Okay. The open ball in the real line is nothing but the open interval. Okay. It is of the form alpha minus r to alpha plus r okay. or we can say in of the form alpha minus epsilon to alpha plus epsilon. Okay. Right. Now, is it clear that such an interval must contain a point from A? We have already seen that if you take any is it positive epsilon, alpha minus epsilon is not an upper bound. So, there must exist x in A such that x is strictly bigger than alpha minus epsilon okay. and it is obviously less than or equal to alpha because alpha is an upper bound. Okay. So, such an x belongs to uh, all this interval alpha minus epsilon alpha plus epsilon. So, in intersection of this with A will be always non empty for every epsilon bigger than C. Okay. Right. That is same as saying that alpha belongs to A closure okay. and in particular it means that if a set is closed that it contains its least upper bound. Okay. Can we say a similar thing about the greatest lower bound also? That is clear. Okay. We can give a similar proof to show that if it is if the set is bounded below then it must uh, then its uh, greatest lower bound also belongs to the closure of A. Okay. So, similarly we can say that if A is bounded below is bounded below and beta is the let us say infimum of A, then this beta belongs to A closure. Okay. So, supremum of A and infimum of A they are, are always in the closure of A and so in particular if A is a closed set it will contain its supremum as well as infimum. Okay. Now, let us go to the uh, example which I was uh, saying that uh, dropping this countable family of open sets can lead to a fairly complicated examples of closed sets and one of the most famous example of this type is what is called Cantor set. Okay. To begin with we take the interval close interval let us say suppose I call that set F 1 okay. I will take F 1 as the interval 0 to 1. Okay. It is it is an example of a closed ball, so it is a closed set. So, we already know that F 1 is closed and we can also say that F 1 is obtained from real line. So, this is let us say uh, close interval 0 to 1. So, it is obtained from the real line by dropping the interval minus infinity to 0 and 1 to infinity. 
okay these two are open intervals okay so if you drop those two intervals from the real line what remains is the set f1 so that's a closed set okay all right now what we do in the next stage is we drop the middle one third of this interval that is you take this interval 1 by 3 to 2 by 3 take this open interval 1 by 3 to 2 by 3 and drop this from the drop that also so what will remain is it will be a uh, closed interval 0 to 1 by 3 and then closed interval 2 by 3 to 1 right okay so what will remain is this so let us take the union of these two so suppose i call that as f2 suppose i call that as f2 okay yeah. then there is also a closed set okay there is also a closed set and so it is obtained from the real line by dropping these two and plus this one okay that drop, dropping three open intervals okay all right okay then we continue this process further now what we do is that so so what is f2 f2 is 0 to 1 by 3 and then 2 by 3 to 1 okay 0 to 1 by 3 and 2 by 3 to 1 then from each of these two intervals i again drop middle one third open interval okay so what is that in this case it will mean uh, uh, 1 by it is 0 to 1 by 3 so you can say i can say i can write this uh, uh, so it will be 1 by 9 to 2 by 9 and from here also it will be something like so this is 3 by 9 it is 4 by 9 to 5 by 9 okay so suppose i drop that so what will remain is this f3 will be say 0 to 1 by 9 union uh, union 2 by 9 to 3 by 9 that is the, the thing but 1 by 3 so 2 by 9 to 1 by 3 and then from here it is 2 by 3 that is 2 by 3 is 4 by 9 so 2 by 3 to 5 by 9 union say 8 by 9 to 9 by 9 that is 1 okay 2 by 3 same as 4 by 9 so 4 by 9 to 5 by 9 so 6 by 9 to uh, 7 by 9 is dropped so remaining is 8 by 9 to 1 okay all right so four union of four closed sets or you can say the same thing as dropping something like five open intervals from or so f3 is also closed okay and then continue this way so at each stage whatever are the see each so cut it this way so suppose i call the nth set like that is fn okay what is fn fn is each fn is a finite union of closed intervals okay each fn is a finite union of closed intervals okay and each fn is obtained from fn minus 1 fn minus 1 will contain a certain finite number of closed intervals so from each of those closed intervals you drop the middle one third open interval okay right so so it will contain uh, so whatever remains will be fn okay what will remains will be fn okay so each fn is closed also f1 contains f2 f2 contains f3 so in general fn contains fn plus 1 okay so what we get is each fn is closed each fn is closed and also fn or i will say if n plus 1 is contained in fn okay such a family of sets is called a decreasing family okay when fn plus 1 is contained in fn it's called a decreasing family of sets so it's a decreasing family of closed sets okay and what is the counter set c counter set c is intersection of all such fn okay so let me just write here suppose i call this counter set c it is intersection of since each fn is closed and we already seen that intersection of any family of closed sets is closed c itself is a closed set okay c is an example of closed set okay now the question is whether the counter set contains any points at all because we have dropped so many intervals but you can see that at no stage 0 or 1 gets dropped okay so counter set obviously contains 0 as well as 
Similarly, it will contain all these endpoints 1 by 3, 2 by 3, these endpoints of the intervals are not getting dropped, okay, right. So, so there will be several such points this 1 by 9, 2 by 9, etcetera, okay. So, so many sets are so many points are there, okay. I will give you an exercise show that uh, 1 by 4 belongs to C, okay. okay. Show that 1 by 4 belongs, it will require some work. But this counter set has several interesting properties and you will come across this set again and again. Mm. There is one way of uh, deciding whether a particular number belongs to a counter set or not, okay. And to do that, we will uh, look at what is called ternary expansion. ternary expansion is similar to a decimal expansion or binary expansion okay decimal expansion is what it is nothing but you write each uh, each real number as a as a decimal num, uh, in its decimal expansion where the digits occurring are 0 to 9 okay digits occurring are 0 okay in binary expansion you take only 0 and 1 okay so similarly in ternary expansion you take 0 1 and 2 okay so, each number since the number are lying between 0 to 1 there will be no integer part. So, every number will be of this form 0 point say x 1, x 2 etcetera, etcetera where each of this x n will be either 0, 1 or 2 that is ternary expansion. So, every number in the interval 0 to 1 you can write using its ternary expansion. Okay. So, what I want to say is that suppose such a number is x, okay. what I want to say is that x belongs to C. Okay if none of these x n's are 1 okay if the ternary if the no digit in the ternary expansion is equal to 1 then that number is in c okay so x belongs to c if and only if sub so that is x x is equal to this point x for which is a ternary expansion if x n if and only if x n is not equal to 1 for all n or in simple language it means its ternary expansion does not contain the digit 1 it will contain only 0 or 2 it will contain only 0 or 2 okay right so show this once you show this okay that will be easy to show that 1 by 4 belongs to c will be easy okay all right secondly once you show this you will also be able to show the following that c is uncountable How will this follow that C is uncountable? You have to show that set of all points whose ternary expansion contains only 0 and 2, that set is uncountable. Okay. 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 The proof will be again similar, the so called diagonal procedure, okay. so called diagonal procedure of Cantor, okay. using that you can see that C is uncountable. So, this Cantor set is uncountable, okay. it, it contains uncountably many points. But another interesting fact is suppose you look at the length of the intervals which are dropped from this interval 0 to 1 okay so in the first stage we had dropped the intervals 1 1 by 3 to 2 by 3 okay so that length of that interval is 1 by 3 okay in the next case, next stage which intervals we have dropped we have dropped two intervals and the length of each of those intervals is 1 by 9 okay so the so the total length that it dropped is 2 by 9 okay of course remember those those intervals are disjoint from this 1 by 3 to 2 by 3 okay because they are coming from here okay and length of each of that is 1 by 9 there are two such intervals okay in the next stage what will happen you will drop four intervals and the length of each of them will be 1 by 27 okay so the total length drop will be plus 4 by 27 etc okay so, if you look, want to look at the sum of the all the intervals dropped, sum of the lengths of all the intervals dropped, that will be given by this infinite series. Okay. That will be given by this infinite series. Now, the obvious question is whether this series converges. Okay. Now, what is the answer? It's a it's a geometric series, geometric series with the common ratio two by three, right? 
and the first term is 1 by 3. Okay. So, obviously it converges and what is its sum? The first term is 1 by 3 and divided by 1 divided by 1 minus 2 by 3. Okay. Right. That will be the sum. Now, what is that? It is nothing but 1, right. Okay. That means, the sum of the length of the intervals dropped that is 1 okay that is 1 okay or which is the same as saying that if you lock if you had some some notation or some notion of the length of any set then the length of the counter set is 0 okay okay because you are from the interval 0 to 1 you have dropped the intervals whose total length is 1 okay so what remains is of length 0 okay. of course this can be made more precise when you have a when you define what is called a measure of a set, which you will do in the next semester when you learn a course on whenever you learn a course on measure and integration, you will make these ideas more precise. So, counter set is an example of a set whose measure is 0, but it is an uncountable set. Okay. All right. okay. I think uh, for the time being uh, we will conclude this discussion about the closed sets and properties of closed sets and let us go to the next uh, next topic okay suppose and suppose we take a matrix space xd and what we want to now say is what is meant by a sequence in x of course we already know define we already know what is meant by sequence okay sequence is a function whose domain is the set of all natural numbers so sequence in x is nothing but a function from n to x okay function from n to x okay so what we want to say now is that what is meant by saying that a sequence in xn converges okay. what a sequence in xn converges to a point in x so let us say xn is a sequence in x where now x is an arbitrary matrix space xn is a sequence in x and suppose you take a point x in x okay so what is the meaning of saying that xn converges to x okay that is what we want to define okay so xn converges to x to x in this big x okay. Okay. so the by definition this means the following of course one can define it in several ways and all those definitions are equivalent and different uh, definition will be useful in different contexts so we shall just see all those things uh, shortly but the first is this okay given any sequence xn like this and a point x in x we can form this d x n x this will be a sequence of real numbers right distance between xn and x that is a re real number and it is a sequence of non negative real numbers okay so we can always talk of what is meant by saying that this sequence of real numbers converges to something that is something that we already defined okay so, if this sequence converges to 0, okay, we say that x n converges to x. Okay, right. So, let me again repeat x n converges to x, it is same as saying that the sequence d x n x converges to 0 and sequence d x n x is a sequence of real numbers and that is something that we have already defined. Okay. So, this is the definition of a convergence of a, of a sequence in now but only thing is that this is a sequence in real numbers whereas this is a sequence in this matrix space okay, this is a sequence in the mat matrix space okay so now we have a definition of what is meant by saying that a sequence in any matrix space converges to some point in that matrix space okay now let us write this in a little more elaborate form and so that way uh, we will be able to prove the various properties of convergent sequences okay now what is the meaning of this suppose i want suppose i write this definition in the full form okay it means that given any epsilon positive i can find some natural number n0 etc okay let us let us write it in the full form so this means the following for every epsilon bigger than 0 there exists n0 in n such that uh, n bigger than or equal to n0 n bigger than or equal to n0 should imply what 
distance between x and x and 0 that is mod d x and x minus 0 that should be less than epsilon, but d x and x is already non negative. Okay. Okay. So, mod d x and x minus 0 is nothing but d x and x. Okay. So, this means distance between x n and x is less than epsilon. Okay. So, what it means is that given any epsilon bigger than 0, there should exist some n 0 such that for all n bigger than or equal to h 0, distance between x n and x is less than epsilon. Okay. All right. Now, what I will do is that I shall just rewrite this last thing distance between x n and x is less than epsilon. Okay. Right. Is it same as saying that x n belongs to an open ball with center at x n? radius epsilon. Okay. So, so that means this last thing is same as saying that x n belongs to open ball with center at x n radius epsilon. Okay. Right. So, what, what, what does it mean that a sequence x n converges to x means every open ball with center at x whatever be the radius okay. every open ball with center at x should contain all points of the sequence after n bigger after some stage n 0. Okay. Let us again go back to our uh, terminology of what we have said eventually. Okay. We say that something some property of a sequence of, of the different elements of a sequence holds eventually if there exists some n 0 such that after for n bigger than or equal to n 0 that property is true. Okay. So, what we can say is that given any open ball with center at x the sequence x n lies eventually in that open ball sequence x n lies eventually in that open ball. Okay. All right. Can I also replace open ball by any open set? Can I also say that every open set containing x okay, will contain the sequence eventually? Okay. So, x n converges to x means every open set containing x will contain the elements of the sequence eventually. Okay. That is another equivalent formulation. Does it also mean that every neighborhood of x contains the sequence x n eventually? Okay. Right. So, let me just write that last thing again that is this is if and only if every neighborhood of x every neighborhood of x contains contains x n eventually. We also describe this same thing saying that x n converges to x okay, by also this same symbol limit of x n as n tends to infinity is equal to x. Okay. This is same as this is just another notation for this same thing x n converges to x okay. and also this notation x n converges to x, x n tends to x okay. sometimes we will say x n tends to x as n tends to infinity. Sometimes we drop this also and simply say x n tends to x. All this is meaning is the same, the sequence x n converges to x. Okay. All right. So, now we have a notion of what is meant by saying that a sequence in any arbitrary matrix space x converges. Okay. All right. Now, there is one obvious thing to follow from here that if a sequence converge of course, a, a general sequence may or may not converge, okay. but whenever it converges okay, it has to converge to a unique point, okay. it cannot converge to two different elements in x, is that clear? Okay. Because suppose you are given any two points let us say x and y in x with x not equal to y, okay. what we have seen is that if you take any two different I think I had given that to you as an exercise, you can always find a number r such that open ball with cent center at x and radius r and open ball with center at y and radius r okay, 
are disjoint okay so this see if x is not equal to y then we can always find let us say suppose i call instead of calling it r suppose i call it epsilon there exists epsilon bigger than 0 such that uh, that is u x epsilon and u y epsilon these two balls are disjoint okay all right now suppose it so happens that x n converges to x also and x n converges to y also okay then all points of x n must lie in this ball eventually and they also must lie in that ball eventually obviously that cannot happen okay or in other words to make this whole argument precise we can say that there will exist some n 1 such that when n is bigger than or equal to n 1 x n is in u x epsilon similarly when n is bigger than or equal to n 2 uh, x n is in u y epsilon and so you can take the maximum of n n 1 and so whenever n is bigger than or equal to both then x n must lie in u x y also sorry u x epsilon also and u y epsilon also and that cannot happen because these two are disjoint <coughs> open parts okay. So in other words if uh, a sequence cannot converge to two distinct points okay. So, so let us uh, so we say that limit of a sequence limit of a convergent sequence is unique limit of a convergent sequence is unique. Now we have already seen several examples of the sequences that converge in real number okay, with, with the usual metric. We can also see a few examples in other metric spaces before going to some more general concepts. Okay. So let us take say x d suppose it is a discrete metric space. then what will be what will be the convergent sequences in this discrete metric space of course constant sequence will co will be converge and it will converge to the same constant but are there any other examples right that is uh, a sequence did not be constant right from the beginning but it has to be eventually constant okay because why because if you can take this suppose this epsilon is less than 1 then this ball with center at x n radius epsilon is nothing but singleton x okay and that means x n has to be equal to x for n bigger than or equal to n 0 okay which is same as saying that after n bigger than or equal to n 0 the terms of the sequence become constant. So in discrete metric space the only convergent sequences are the ones which are eventually constant okay. So we can say that then we can say that x n is convergent convergent if and only if x n is eventually constant let me just write it this way eventually constant. That means the first few terms may be different but after some stage it must become a constant sequence okay. So these are the only sequences which converge okay. these are the only sequences which converge. Okay, all right. Let us take some other space. Uh, okay, in case of R, we already know. Okay. In case of R, we already know what are the convergent sequences, etc. We have we have done a complete uh, thorough discussion on that. So, so let us take some other space. Okay, so let me take the space R two. Okay. Okay. Now, to discuss the sequences. Okay, so till now we have been using this. Suppose I take a point X. I denote that point x as uh, x1 x2 okay right okay. Now I will slightly change this notation because this notation is not very convenient when I want to discuss the sequences in R2 because then I will have to take say suppose this is xn then that will confuse with this x1 and x2 okay. So instead of this I shall now use this notation x1 and x2 okay x1 and x2 okay that is the first coordinate is x of 1 second coordinate is x of 2 what is the advantage if I take a sequence xn now if I take a sequence xn now 
I can say that this x n that will be x n 1 and x n 2. Okay. So, in other words every sequence x n in R 2 will give rise to two sequences of real numbers say x n 1 and x n 2 okay, x n 1 and x n 2 okay, all right. Of course, to talk about the convergence in R 2 we have to start with some metric in R 2 okay, some metric. Let us take the so called one metric given by the one norm okay. What is the one matrix that is norm of x is mod x 1 plus mod x 2 okay, mod x 1 plus mod x 2. Then what I want to say is the following okay, the sequence x n converges to x in R 2 converges to x in R 2 if and only if if and only if what should happen? Both should converge. That is both the sequence <laughs> x n 1 and x n 2 both should converge and converge to what? Same limit. x n 1 should converge to x 1 and x n 2 should converge to x 2 okay. x n 1 should converge to x 1 okay. So, uh, if and only if I will say x n 1 converges to x 1 and x n 2 converges to x 2 I mean everywhere you can write as n density if you want to okay. okay. Now, how does that follow? How do, how do we prove this? Okay, I mean basically we have to look at the way in which okay this this is what we had called norm suffix one okay this is what we had called norm suffix one okay so basically we have to look at the way in which this norm suffix one is defined okay so suppose we look at say uh, distance but see what is distance between x n and x okay what we have to show is that the sequence x n converges to x means given any epsilon you can find some n zero such that whenever n is bigger than or equal to n zero this this is less than epsilon, but what is the distance between x n and x in this case it is nothing but norm of x n minus x right suffix 1 okay. norm of x n minus x suffix 1 and what is this by that definition it is nothing but mod x n 1 minus x 1 plus mod x n 2 minus x 2 okay. That is the definition. Okay. Okay. Is it also correct to say that this bus will be always bigger than or equal to mod x n 1 minus x 1? Okay. Right. Okay. Will it also be bigger than or equal to this mod x n 2 minus x 2? Okay. All right. Okay, now, does it follow from here that if this is less than epsilon, okay, these two also will be less than epsilon. Okay. So, this this way it is clear okay. if x n converges to x then x n 1 must converge to x 1 and x n 2 must converge to x 2. Okay. All right. What about the converse? Suppose you know that x n 1 converges to x 1 and x n 2 converges to x 2. How will I show the x n converges to x? Again, the usual that epsilon by two proofs. Okay, we can say that uh, given any epsilon, you find n one such that this part becomes less than epsilon by two. Okay, there will exist some n two because so that whenever n is bigger than or equal to n two, this becomes less than epsilon by two. Okay, and then this whole thing will become less than epsilon for n bigger than or equal to both n one and n two. Nothing new idea. Okay, usual way of proofs. Okay. So, what, what it means is that if you take a sequence x n in R 2 okay, then that is that converges to some point x in R 2 if and only if 
x n 1 converges to x 1 and x n 2 converges to x 2 ok all right. Is there anything particular about this number 2 here? Can I replace that by say r r? So, what will, can we say that the same thing will be varied even if I take r 3, r 4, r 5, anything? Arguments will be similar, ok. So, we can say that in general x n converges to x in r k, ok, r k. Of course, r k with this norm, ok, r k with this norm. What will the norm there? It will be mod x1 plus mod x2 etc up to mod xk. So, instead of this I will say xnj converges to xj for j equal to 1 to etc up to k ok. Right. What will be the obvious change in the argument? Obviously, if xn converges to x each of this number mod xnj minus xj each of them are going to be less than or equal to distance between x n and x ok. So, this way the it is trivial ok and then for the reverse argument you will have to take something like epsilon by k and then take n 1, n 2, n k etcetera for each of those coordinates ok that is that is straightforward ok. In other words what we can say is that in this space r k uh, a sequence x n converges to x if every sequence x n will give rise to k sequences formed by these different coordinates ok. And if all those k sequences converges then x converges or vice versa ok all right ok. So, let us take a slightly different question instead of this norm suppose I use some other norm ok. Suppose I look at what let us say norm suffix infinity ok. What is norm suffix infinity? It is it is the maximum of mod x 1 mod x 2 etcetera ok. Will the same similar not the same, but will the similar proof work ok. This part is true because this is the maximum. So, each of this so mod x n j minus x j will be less than or equal to this. Here you will have to devise some other argument ok. So, what is important is that it does not matter even if you take some other norm this thing will be still true ok. Whatever whatever norm you take here ok it will be still be true that if x n converges to x if I do not leave x n j converges to x j for each j. All right, and a similar thing you can say about this space also C k, okay, right? Because there also norms are defined in a similar manner, okay. And again, not only for this norm one or norm suffix infinity, but even those so many norm suffix p that we have defined, okay. For that also, for those norms also, this will still be true. Okay, we shall not repeat the argument because the arguments are essentially similar. Okay, okay. Okay, now, let us go back to again a general matrix space and we consider a similar concept of what is known as a ok let me write here ok. In case of real numbers we have defined what is meant by a Cauchy sequence right ok. We can we can take the same similar concept in arbitrary matrix space now ok. So, suppose x d is a matrix space and x n is a sequence in x sequence in x ok. Then we will say that x n is said to be a Cauchy sequence in x. If where is this term? Cauchy sequence. If what should happen for every epsilon bigger than zero, every epsilon bigger than zero, there exists n zero in n. There exists n zero in n such that if you take any two n and m bigger than or equal to n zero, then the distance between x n and x m should be less than epsilon ok. So, so what we say is n and m bigger than or equal to n 0 this implies distance between x n and x m is less than epsilon. 
these are the illustrations of the concepts which we generalize from the real numbers to any matrix space. Okay. What we have done is that we have just replaced the definition of a usual Cauchy sequence by see in the usual uh, Cauchy sequence of real numbers this would have been mod x n minus x n which is nothing but distance between x n and x m in the real numbers. So, what we have done is that the kind of things that we define in the case of real numbers we just generalize that to any matrix space. So, now we can talk of what is meant by a Cauchy sequence in any matrix space. Okay. All right. Now, what do we know about the relation between a Cauchy sequence and convergent sequence in real numbers? We know that every convergent sequence is Cauchy okay. and we also know that every Cauchy sequence is convergent. Okay. All right. Now, let us see which of these things are true in arbitrary matrix space. Okay. All right. So, first of all it is fairly easy to show that in any matrix space every convergent sequence is Cauchy. Okay. So, that is we can say that is the theorem. Okay. Every convergent sequence is Cauchy. Every convergent sequence is Cauchy. Okay. All right. Now, before going to the proof of that theorem. Uh, let me again make a comment on these spaces R2, R3, Rk, etc. Okay. Now, we have seen some description of convergent sequences in each of these spaces. Suppose I want a similar description about the Cauchy sequences. Okay. Instead of saying that Xn converges to X in Rk, suppose I say that suppose I want to say Xn is a Cauchy sequence. in R k okay. x n is a Cauchy sequence in R k. Okay. What will this be replaced by if and only if what can you say? Cauchy sequence. Can we say if and only if each of this x n j we can say that this will be replaced by say that x n j is a Cauchy sequence of is a Cauchy sequence. for j equal to 1 to k. Okay. So, what we are saying is that in each of these spaces R, R k, if you take any sequence it leads to k sequences of real numbers by taking coordinate wise. Okay. So, if the sequence x n is convergent each of those k sequences should be convergent. Similarly, if the sequence x n is Cauchy okay, each of those k sequences also should be Cauchy and vice versa. Let us also look at some other spaces. Okay, we'll we'll come to this theorem little later. Okay, for example, let us take the space L one. Okay, what is, what was the space L one? We have said that it is a space of all sequences such that sigma mod x n is convergent. Okay, all right. So, so this is the space of all sequence x such that x is from n to r such that sigma mod instead now in a using a similar notation instead of calling it x n I shall call it uh, x x of let us say x of uh, j j going from 1 to infinity this is a convergent series okay that is description of x n okay okay and we have seen that this is a matrix space in fact it is a norm linear space with the norm given by this norm suffix 1 of x is sigma mod x j j going from 1 to infinity. Okay. Now, I can ask the similar questions in this space itself. Okay, right. So, suppose now I take a sequence x n in L 1, sequence x n in L 1. Okay. In spaces like R k and C k what was happening? That if you take one sequence in R k that lead led to k sequences of real numbers. In this case, what will happen? 
Yeah, there will be infinitely many sequences. But if Xn is a sequence in L1, each of this Xn z, this will be a sequence in R. Okay. okay. Each of this Xn z will be for each z. So this is for for each z in okay for each z in N. Okay. And then we can ask a similar question here also. Okay. Suppose x n tends to x in L 1. Okay. Suppose x n converges to x in L 1, then can we say that each of this x n j converges to x j as a sequence of real number. Okay. I think I will stop with this. We shall uh, consider the proof of this theorem tomorrow.